acting is not about feeling. If it were, it would be called, we're doing feelings here. <laughs> acting means actions. And my job here is to have you turn everything you're fighting for and its opposite into an action. I do not believe in the concept of power. I don't think it's power people want. It's to prove that they are right. Power is an idiotic concept. And every war and everything else is about, I am right and you are wrong. One of the things that actors have to bring back into the world is curiosity. We live in a society in which everybody, so anxious to be sophisticated and in the know, knows everything. And what they don't know, they refuse to admit they don't know. So they don't find out new things. Human beings are compounded of opposites. We have the constructive side of us that tries to create. We have the destructive side of us that's drawn toward death and destruction. And we have to keep fighting this conflict in us to be creative when the destructive side is always lurking around, ready to destroy us. I didn't do this, I didn't do that, they don't want this, they don't want that, I'm not pretty enough, etc., etc. They probably want an American, etc., etc. That's the destructive opposite side of her, working against her creative side. She's hanging on like hell for her creative side and her destructive side and says, you can't have that. <laughs> But we're here because we went to bed last night and woke up this morning and said, maybe I can have that. Michael Shirtliff is said to have invented the position of casting director on Broadway. His unique eye for talent led to career launching vehicles for Barbara Streisand, Elliot Gould, Dustin Hoffman, Christopher Walken, Ben Vereen, Robert Duvall, and Gene Hackman. His years of experience casting for the stage and films culminated in the publishing of his landmark book, Audition, which has since become the focus of his current teaching endeavors. His long-standing relationship with producers like Stuart Ostrow, Ray Stark, Gene Walsh, and David Merrick, and remarkable collaboration with such directors as Bob Fosse, Ulla Grossbard, and Mike Nichols, Michael's expertise transcended to film, where he cast The Graduate. The Sound of Music, Sand Pebbles, Jesus Christ Superstar, and all that jazz. Today, as a teacher, author, and playwright, Michael travels the globe, still influencing a new generation of actors. Across the street is the Imperial Theater, where I think I spent most of my theatrical life. For example, uh, I worked on Pippin, which Bob Fosse directed and choreographed for five years. So we were in that theater constantly we, uh, auditioning. First, we auditioned for a year and a half to find the right people to do the show. And then, as it was such an enormous success, it ran year after year. We had to constantly be there auditioning replacements. I also, the first show I did there was Gypsy with Ethel Merman and Jerome Robbins, the original Gypsy. And then I did Carnival with uh, Gower Champion and um, Destry Rides Again with Andy Griffiths and Bill Arts Gray, and um, many, many other shows. So I, I feel I, I spent, that was my second home. I spent all the time in the Imperial Theater. Well, what you're fighting for is is to sleep with to her. Sleep with her. Right. Why do you want to sleep with her? Because I love her. I really like her. I'm blown away with her. Okay. All right. Then why, why did you spend most of the scene running away from her? Have you got something in your eye? Oh, it's nothing. No. It's nothing. It's just a speck of dust. It'll be gone in a minute. Oh, my sleeve must have brushed against me. Sit down. Let me look at it. <laughs> oh, would you hold still? Well, I do believe you're trembling. Big, strong man though you are. Ooh, Miss what Julie. muscles. Miss Julie. Woo. Yes, Monsieur Jean. Je ne suis qu'un homme. 
Stay still. There, now it's out. Kiss my hand and say thank you. Miss Julie, listen. Kristen's gone to bed now. Will you listen? Kiss my hand first. Very well. But you'll only have yourself to blame. What, Tam Tamara or Tamara? Tamara. Tamara. Tamara had a wonderful sense of mischief, didn't she? Mm -hmm. Now, this is the quality <laughs> that she has that she used wonderfully in the scene. And it's one of the things that you must cultivate in yourselves, because you all have it, because it's, it's what appeals to us enormously. Jack Nicholson has a whole lifelong career based on just being mischievous <laughs> all the time. <laughs> What's the part of the body that gets turned on the most? So, good, down here. Yes. Why does everyone act above the waist? What's wrong with the crotch? Nothing. Well, why didn't you use it? Oh, God, I don't know. I didn't even think about it. Are you that uninteresting in bed? <laughs> oh, ask, he says. <laughs> ask, he says. <laughs> How many of you ask? How, how actors want to act from here on up. Now, what do you think of yourself sexually? Um, I, I think I have a lot of sexuality. I'm uh, always, like in day-to-day -day life. I'm Latin American, I'm from Panama. I love this idea. Well, I'm from South uh, 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 America, so of course we're all sexy. <laughs> oh, no, but I'm from sexy. the North, and of not course we're not. Sexy. Huh? Not necessarily sexy as opposed to sexual. What's the difference? Well, there's something really sexual about holding somebody's hand, but it's not particularly sexy. Do you know what I mean? No. <laughs> there can be, I mean, there can be something so sexual about, about two people standing in front of each other and, and nothing sexual about having sex. Do you realize that in the conversation that we've had, You've done about 40 sexual things toward her that you didn't do in the scene. <laughs> now, why? Because if... I'm from Panama. I don't know. Well, I've been working for Jean Dalrymple, I think, for about four years. And my marriage ended, not in divorce as marriages usually do, but my wife became catatonic and I had to have her institutionalized, which it took me a, a year to manage. And so I thought, I've got to start a new life. And I got to get out of this New York and start it somewhere. And I saw a cartoon in The New Yorker, two bimbos sitting at a bar with, with spiky old shoes and high piled blonde hair. And one said to the other one, oh, this town. I'm going to move to another town and start all over again as a virgin. So I took that as my credo. And I went to New Haven and enrolled at Yale in the Department of Drama and never told anybody I'd been married or anything else about my past and started my life all over again as a virgin. Yale was important to, uh, to Michael and me and a group of people that then came to New York from Yale and became allies with each other, largely because of our uh, uh, sort of uh, antagonist position in relation to Yale, because you can learn from being in accord with teachers or you can learn from from uh, doubting and wondering and having to construct your own way. And part of what happened with Michael there was some contention over a play that he wrote, which uh, crossed the uh, kind of very repressive, constrictive kind of notions of what you should put on the stage in those days. And the faculty uh, came down on him pretty hard. And all of us, uh, of course, sided with him, naturally, and, and rightly so, I would say. And I think that was a, probably a useful learning experience for him, that he had to stand up for himself and what, for what he wanted to put on the stage. Michael was, uh, in his early career, was a casting director, and he cast a number of, uh, of plays that I directed. And after one session of uh, auditioning actors, uh, I said to him, you know, Michael, actors don't know how to audition you ought to start a class. You ought to teach them how to audition. 
And that was the beginning. He thought that over, I think, for, I think it was a couple of months. And he started his first class, and indeed he did have something to, to teach them. Because he said, nobody else knows about audition as much as you do. You should teach people how to audition, since obviously they don't know how. So um, I think it was through George that I met Gene Hackman. And he did two plays of mine directed by Milton Katsalas in New York, which followed um, Call Me By My Rightful Name. Rashomon was a kind of um, uh, theater piece that you would not expect to be produced. Uh, that it was, uh, at that time, it was, uh, it was too off-Broadway, probably. It was too, uh, um, I don't know what you would call it, but it didn't, it didn't feel like that it was very commercial. So it was attractive, you know, because it was different. Well, there was something about Gene, less so now than in those days, that I, I felt, uh, knowing his work as I did, that there was a kind of a, uh, a strength underlying, but a uh, weakness, a kind of a, uh, inhibited quality, a shy quality. And this character was an alcoholic, and uh, he bent under the strength of this woman. And yet there was a moment that he came out. So that combination intrigued me. And he's a large man, and that was even more touching. It was interesting working on it because um, I had never been that deep into, um, into a play prior to that. I, I had done a lot of improvisation and a lot of things that um, uh, were superficial to some degree. So it was, it was a great learning experience for me. And Gene, years later, I was going to the theater movie and Gene, I was in line and Gene came up to me and said something like that production helped him very much and, and uh, uh, sort of focused his power because there was a controversy or a problem between him and the character that Estelle played and he had to stand up to her. And I told him in one rehearsal, I said, don't let her beat you. And uh, he, he did that, it was part of the play and he did that, and uh, he felt there was a real gaining for him as an actor. And I felt at that time it was extremely important to me because I felt that the work I did in that, even though we, we, did, we only uh, played it, I think, twice in front of an audience, um, that the work I did in that was like a real breakthrough for me. And that was really because of Michael uh, Sherliff and, and Milton Katsalas. And there was something about the piece, the, the play itself, and the working atmosphere and the kind of uh, work that Michael uh, had done on the play and the relationship between myself and Estelle Parsons and Richard wrote that um, just kind of something happened with me. I just, it was like a, um, a monkey off my back or something. I didn't feel armored any longer as an actor. I felt like I could, uh, um, whatever I did was going to be all right. It was the beginning for me of a kind of um, subconscious work that I have been very interested in ever since then. You must be sure that you can create events and indicate that to them in every audition you do and everything you perform in. Because if you can't create events, they won't hire you. They can't take the chance because it's eventless writing. And the same with, you know, doing Samuel Beckett or Ionesco or anybody else. Eventless writing. It's odd that the worst writing and the best writing in the world are both eventless. And you have to add the events. Yes, ma'am. In an audition, if you have another actor who doesn't really want to physicalize, it sort of makes you look like you're fighting too hard for no, what you want. No, no, no. I can physicalize all I want and you can stand still and it'll work. I'll show you. I'll show you. Do you want to come up here? Is this going to hurt? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh-oh. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm creating an event. What, what's the event I'm creating? That, that we're having a terrible fight and this marriage is going to end. Okay? Okay. Wow. <laughs> You're not, you're not doing anything. Oh, I You just... You don't really, want me to do anything, or you want me to... Well, well if somebody's being choked, is he going to do something? Yes, I'm going to get out of it. Yeah. All right, then he gets out of it. Okay. You don't want it that way. I'm 
Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. I didn't mean to hit that hard. N normally, normally you can yeah. just go like that and not even yeah. touch it. And, and, and then you still won't give in. Yeah. Okay. Don't give in. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to do a fucking thing. No, that's true. Sooner or later they will. Uh, yeah. yeah. They'll wake up. <laughs> <laughs> Just stand there. You can do anything you want. To. <laughs> I don't think I'm a tough teacher, but I understand that many people think I am a tough teacher. Sometimes students call my house and ask for Michael Shirtliff, and I say, he's not here. Can I help you? And they say, well, I'd like to know, is he a tough teacher? And I say, no, he's not tough. His bark is worse than his bite. But what he requires is great discipline and enormous commitment and that you be on time. None of this California late stuff. But he's not tough. He's, she's really very, very constructive about your work. They don't know that it's me. Aaron Melendez. That was the most peculiar casting experience I ever had. Peter Brook had done it in London. So Anna, Anna White and I went to London to see it together. And then we had talks with him about it. And then I went back and began uh, screening, casting for all the roles. And Elliot Gould was one of the persons who came in to audition. So I thought, oh, he's, he's, gonna, he's great. He's going to be great for one of the mechs. And they weren't a chorus in the ordinary sense of a Broadway show. And this was not an ordinary Broadway show. It was an intimate show in an intimate theater. So that was the only show I ever cast without the director there at all. Well, it, it, was prob it was my first kind of ensemble show, you know. It, there were many, many different parts, and everybody did different things. And, um, of course, we had Elliot Gould. I had six dancers, two tall ones, two medium size, and two shorts. Those, those were my six dancers, and Elliot Gould was one of them. Can you believe it? Well, I, I was studying uh, uh, modern jazz with uh, a, a dance teacher named uh, Eugene Lewis, uh, uh, or Luigi. And uh, he recommended me to Anna White who choreographed Irma Ladeuse, and the initial uh, uh, auditions were for Anna and, uh, and Mike. And then when uh, we were all uh, pruned down to the a group that was castable, Peter Brook came in and we all auditioned for him. And uh, uh, that was a great uh, turning point uh, for me. It was a, somewhat of an innovational musical. I was very happy to be a part of it. When Peter Brook finally came over, I said to Peter, you see that tall boy there? He's, God, he's funny. So if you have any lines to give him or anything, I think he would do well. So he did. And he really, he gave him, and Elliot was very funny in the show, doing different things and different parts. When it came time to do I Can Get It For Your Wholesale, with Arthur Lawrence, who was an old friend and I had worked with often, uh, I said, I have, there's somebody really interesting that I think you should see for this role. Because uh, David Merrick wanted Eddie Fisher, and Arthur Lawrence said, Eddie Fisher to me. And I said to Arthur Lawrence, Eddie Fisher. And uh, so we knew we had to find something else. I was uh, dancing in the chorus of Irma La Douce, which was uh, another David Merrick production. Uh, for whom uh, Mike Shirtliff uh, cast and decided that I would audition for this leading role. And uh, it was uh, my first principal role. I'd only been in the chorus. So uh, uh, I graduated uh, from a chorus role into this uh, very demanding, large uh, vehicle. Well, Miss Marmelstein in Wholesale was the name of uh, the character of my secretary. And uh, I recall the first person to audition 
in relation to my playing this male role was uh, Miss Streisand. And uh, I'm sure that I was aware of her intelligence uh, prior to uh, our breaking in in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is where I was being fired, but I was able to survive and uh, uh, get to Boston and then open in New York. So then Elliot came in and, and sat down and I said, I hear you've met the woman of your dreams. And he said, yes, I have met the woman of my dreams. I owe it all to you. And uh, I said, are you going to marry her? And he said, oh, she won't marry me. I said, well, ask her. So he did and she did. And uh, I used to see them after that. They would drive around New York and after the show, after wholesale, in horse and buggies. It was stopping everywhere to get an ice cream cone. They would have about 12 ice cream cones at 2 o'clock in the morning. I would see them having ice cream cones. And I would think, I, I wish I had a horse and carriage to go and get ice cream cones with. performer who has wanted to work for the likes of uh, Bob Fosse and Mike Nichols and uh, David Merrick, uh, Joshua Logan, Gower Champion, whoever, uh, has had to win Mr. Shirtliff's approval first. And now he has put his accumulated knowledge into a book. Uh, it's called Audition, and it's uh, quite likely to become a Bible and handbook for everyone who has ever had to go through the awful experience of trying out for something. Uh, in a few minutes, I myself am going to do an audition for Mr. Shirtliff, and he will give me a few pointers. <laughs> or not. But first, will you welcome, please, Michael Shirtliff. Is there something you watch for from the minute they enter? Yes. I mean, One of the things I look for most is do they want to be here or do they wish they were somewhere else? And if they wish they were somewhere else, it makes me very uneasy because an actor's got to be like a prize fighter, anxious to get into the ring, or a mm -hmm. bullfighter, anxious to get out there and fight. And so many actors come on as if they wish they were anywhere else than going through this ordeal of the audition. Let's take a well-known person's audition that you recall from your own experience, um, maybe Streisand, and then we could examine that for what we can learn from it. I had her in, then finally a role came along that I thought would be right for her, mm -hmm. uh, which was in I Can Get It For You Wholesale. So she was the last audition of the day, and she was late, and the auditors were getting very restless, wanted to go home. And I said, no, no, she'll be here, I'm sure she'll be here. And she came rushing in, running on stage, in a raccoon coat, and about the size that would fit Elliot Gould, mm -hmm. and two shoes that didn't match. What? Two shoes that didn't match, a purple shoe and a green shoe, if I remember the colors correctly, this and said, I'm sorry I'm late, I'm sorry I'm late, but I saw these shoes in a thrift shop window, and I just knew I had to have them, and that's why I'm late. Mm -hmm. And then we acknowledged the shoes, and asked her to sing, and she said, fine. She started to sing, and she stopped and said, I, I have to have a stool. So the stage manager went and got a stool. By this time, the auditors were getting, looking at me as if, what have you done to us? And then she started to sing again and stopped and took the gum out of her mouth and stuck it under the stool, and finally she sang. Well, the singing was glorious, and they were very excited, and they all went up on stage to talk to her at the end. And after everyone had left, including Miss Dryce and Arthur Lawrence, who was the director of the show, and I were talking, and he had his hands on the stool, and he turned it upside down, and we looked, and there was no gum. And he said to me, Michael, what kind of a girl do we have on our hands? A girl who chews imaginary gum. And who chews imaginary gum. A girl with imagination, a girl who yes. takes risks, because those are big risks to take. And they yes. paid off in her case. OK, could we have Dick Cavett next? Good well, morning. Hello. How are uh, you? Good. Say, uh, I'm sorry about my clothes. I came from another audition. I know they're not exactly right, but. OK, that's fine. And uh, I brought a pipe. I notice it calls for one. I'm not used to smoking one, but. Pipe's a good idea. OK. Uh, would you start with Jerry's line, do you mind if we talk? OK. This is Matt Carlson reading with you. Yeah. How you do? Nice to meet you. Say, so if that's Mr. Albee out there, I'd just like to say how much I enjoyed his last play. And, <laughs> and also remember, when, whenever you have a situation like this, Louise, one, one, one turns the attack into a game, right, in order to get away with it. Oh, you so, can do it.
So you can slam right into it. Yeah. And, you know, people tear you to pieces and, and you're in tears and they say, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, that's the game we yeah. play all the time. Only I think we should leave out the I'm just kidding part and just go ahead and do it. Because every time people tell me they're kidding, it's real. And they just don't want to be caught with it. But it's the way we get away with it is to turn it into a game. So I thought the competitive game should have had much higher stakes for you, in, just in terms of wins and losses. Okay. Acting problems? Okay. Acting problems? No, you just tell you us. You tell me. Oh, okay. What is Lee's kidney's biggest acting problem? Yeah, you tell me first, then I tell you. Okay, I think it's probably the confidence to really, excuse the French, fucking go for it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Is that lack of confidence? What will make you confident? Saying that I won't make it if I can stay like this. Yeah. Your, your problem is that you, you try to, to protect yourself from the possibility of being wrong. To hell with being wrong. All right, just do it. Just think about yourself of, of jumping off a diving board, a real high diving board you never dove off before. And, you, and somebody has dared you. And then you, you just take, use that in your moment before. Someone just dared me to jump off that board. I don't even know if there's water in that fucking pool. I'm gonna jump. And you gotta figure out what are you protecting yourself from? Usually one doesn't even know what that is. It's what they think that you're protecting yourself from. Well, if you can get to the point where you don't give a fuck what they think, that what you're doing is more important than what they think, then you'll do it. So you really have to psych yourself up and stop worrying about them and worry about what's going on between the two of you. And the stronger you make anything that's going on between the two of you, the better it's going to be. The, uh, we're talking about things you can do something about. You can't do a fucking thing about the audience. So why worry about them? That's their problem. Uh, human beings are raised at once they're past childhood to not touch each other. To touch each other is an intrusion. So to get over that, especially when you bring two strange actors together, the way to get them um, most used to each other and unafraid to touch is to make them do animal improv. And the minute they start thinking that they're not a human being anymore, they're an animal, they can do all these things that animals do. Because animals, you know, run around touching each other all the time, have no inhibition about it at all. So it breaks down the fastest way that I've ever found this feeling of estrangement between human beings. So they can touch each other. Once they've touched each other and done this, then they can do anything. It frees them physically to be like animals. The first week that I moved to New York, I went to the theater twice. One night I saw Death of a Salesman, and two nights later I saw A Streetcar Named Desire. And I thought, oh my God, the rest of my life is going to be like this, with plays like this all the time. Not knowing, of course, that I was seeing two of the masterpieces of our time, and it might be years before I'd see another one. But that, that memory has never left me that that was my impression of what Broadway was going to be like. Actors come to me all the time and they say, do you think I should be an actor? Do I have the talent to be an actor? And I say to them, if you could be happy doing anything else in the world, for God's sakes, go and do something else. Don't be an actor. And to be an actor is only for the incurably diseased. It is a horrible life, insecure, torture. Even the people at the top of their profession advise their children not to be actors. So if you have a choice, don't do it. I suggest this to you. Write down what you are fighting for. Now, 
The answer to what you are fighting for should be the answer to this question. What would I want from this person if I could have anything in the world that I need? I find that the word for is the operative word and fight. Because there will be a scene in which a, a man is saying, I'm leaving you. I am no longer in love with you, et cetera, et cetera. So I say to him, what do you want in this scene? He said, I want to get out of here. And I said, but you're still here. If you want to get out, you'd leave a note saying, dear Myrna, it's over. Fuck off, John. I can't take one more rejection. <laughs> if you're still there, you still want something. So you're still fighting for something. So get into your head, those other terms are fine, I'm not objecting to them, add the stronger concept of what you're fighting for. Do all of you know this play? What do you think the play is about? What do you think it's about? The play is about games people play and how much they enjoy them. That's the very relationships true. relationships that they Yeah. Enjoy now, but, but much more specific, please. What games? It's all manners. It's none of its real feelings. It's just... Of course there well, are real feelings. It's real feelings. That's, That's the kind of judgment that makes for bad acting. I, well, I didn't mean there's not, there's real, not real feelings involved. Yes, you did. You said so. Yeah, but... Trying to cover I'm, up yeah, what you really feel. Thanks, thanks for the help, Gail. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Gail. <laughs> I knew what she meant. <laughs> she knew what I meant. Now, it's more specific. You're, you're absolutely right, but let's get more specific. What is it about? What are the games about? It's not saying what you really feel. It's saying what you think you need to say to get what you want. Language is very important to these people. Who says what, what way? But it is all based on perversity. Perversity and real estate. This is a play about real estate. Now you see, I wouldn't guess that. I would not. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think about it, aren't all the arguments about where people live? What part, even if you live on the correct block, do you live in the correct house? And if you live in the country, my God, compared to the city, it's all about real estate. And so is modern life. It's certainly in New York City. So, um, and perversity. I'm happy to say it's on the increase. <laughs> <laughs> Due largely to the effect of this play and the sexual revolution. Now, why, did, why was Gail more effective than Nahani? Philip. Gail seemed to, to have uh, something that she was fighting for and something that, that was much stronger than Nahani's objective. Do you agree? Yeah. What were you fighting for? Well, at first I was fighting to make her, to be friends with her because I don't, I don't have anybody to talk, I have no friends, and I'm alone, alone in the country, and I'm about to get married. Now, did you and change then, and then what I you were fighting for? And then I because I've, I was fighting to, to be the most attractive woman, to, to, to be the winner of Ernest. Okay. I was fighting for Ernest. What you're fighting for does not change in the scene. It is a constant. What you are talking about are different ways of going about what you're fighting for. The strongest thing to fight for is, Ah, my rival. Mm -hmm. I'm going to outdo her if I have to kill her in the country and bury her under the tulips. Well, uh, uh, Canadians are much more gentle people, uh, shyer, but. Um, but I, people keep saying to me, uh, don't you find them less passionate than Americans, etc. Not in acting. Uh, I find them um, very passionate and very willing to take risks 
and, and just anxious. Just somebody just needs to give them a push, and and then the way they go. So I don't. I I, I find actors, uh, wonderful actors in Toronto. Every time I come here, very very exciting actors. Well, when I got married, my my I hate rings, so my wife and I decided to get silver bracelets instead of rings. So this has never been off my arm for 30 years. And even when I've had operations, they say, that has to come off. And I say, well, get it off if you can. They never can get it off. It's soldered on for life. Well, all the rest are to celebrate love affairs, one for each love affair, since my marriage ended. George Morrison was the director of Any Wednesday. It was produced by George W. George and Frank Granite. And so we brought Gene Hackman in to read, and they did not want an unknown leading man. So we had to bring him in again and again to insist that he was the one. It turned out that um, the producers didn't really want me for it. They, they wanted somebody else. and, and um, But George insisted, and I finally, I finally got the part. Uh, and then uh, about two weeks later, he was fired from the production, which was really devastating. And I, I went on, and, and, the, <laughs> and the play was a big hit. It ran for two years. Sandy Dennis played the lead, and Rosemary Murphy played the wife. It was an enormous success, although poor George Morrison got fired by the producers on the road and never got credit. Another director came in and directed three days before it opened, and he got all the credit and all the royalties for a play that ran for years. George and, and uh, Ulu Grossbard and Gene Walsk and, and, and I think Rose Gregorio was, was uh, Ulu's uh, wife, were all at, at Yale at the same time, uh, along with Michael Shirtliff. And they, they seemed to uh, had arrived at a kind of an attitude, maybe not a really working, uh, a way to work yet, but an attitude about theater and about acting and about what it should be. And, that, and I happened to meet all those people at the same, uh, the same summer, the first summer I went to New York. But Gene did the most remarkable thing. When he got his Academy Award, Gene Hackman, he's the only one I know who got up and said, I owe my career to the man who taught me how to act, George Morrison. Well, I, I really felt that, that he was responsible for me being up there, um, that, that the kind of work that we did, I, I studied with him eight years, I think, um, was it really uh, grounded me. It really, everything I do is based on, on those years. Uh, I was, when I was casting The Apple Tree with Mike Nichols and Stuart Ostro, I had heard that Dustin Hoffman was taking singing lessons. So I called and asked him to come in. We made an appointment, he didn't come. We made another appointment, he didn't come. This went on for about three months. And every day, Mike Nichols would come and say, is the famous Dustin Hoffman going to appear today? And I'd say, we have an appointment, I don't know. So finally one day, I said to Dustin, he said, I've got to have more lessons, I can't come in. I said, fuck the lessons, come in. So he came in and he sang. And, and Mike Nichols said, you're right, you're a bad singer. Uh, would you read for me? So he read, and he read magnificently. And it was a result of that, that two years later, Mike Nichols, remembering this reading of Dustin Hoffman's, cast him in The Graduate, against the wishes of the producer and the studio and everybody else under the sun, saying, why are you casting this little gnome from New York when we need a new, tall, handsome, young James Stewart? That's what made a great star of Dustin Hoffman. I'd go to the back of the stage, and, and here, would, um, here would Laurence Olivier be, wearing braces, bent over, with glasses like this. Peter, darling, when did you tell me I was to move? What line am I to move over to Tony? Oh, that line? And I thought, oh my god, how are we ever going to get Beckett out of this poor old man? 
it's the opening night, and so I'm standing there watching him come out of his dressing room, stand in the wings, and suddenly pull himself together, and I watched 25 or 30 years drop off this man within a matter of seconds, and on rushes this romantic young leading man. It was the most remarkable transformation of mind over matter, and I thought, boy, this is really an actor. I love Trigorin. I, I love him more than even before. Oh, another subject for a little story. I love him, I love him passionately, desperately. Do you remember Kostya, the old days? Do you remember when life was straightforward and warm and happy? And our feelings, our feelings were like little flowers, beautiful and delicate. One problem and uh, some questions. What were you fighting for? What, the main thing is she's at the big crossroads in her life. Who? I'm at the big crossroads in my life. And I've got to make some really big decisions. And I think I've come back to, to have him save me initially. Yes. And I start off, I think, with the decision that I'm going to go in there and clean it up, up everything so I have a clean slate and start again. And the minute I see his face, it's like, fuck, what am I doing? You know, what, which way do I go? Tell me, do I go forward, no, do I go back? No, not that soon. Not that soon? No. What was needed was for you to throw each other in each other's arms. You took, you looked at each other and I thought, oh Christ, the reason you come back is to be saved. Why will he save you? Because I know that he will always love me. Are you loved by anyone? Not at the moment. No. <laughs> what do you mean not at the moment? Not for a long time. Tregoran yeah. keeps getting in the way. Okay, so do you not come here seeking to try to love him because he loves you? Yeah. Okay. That needed to be stronger expressed in the scene. And, I, and surely the opening should be the two of you throwing each other into each other's arms. You've been dying to see each other for years. You've been walking up and down for days. He's been waiting for years. And then you just stand there and look at each other? We, we, we were doing it that way. Well, why not? Well, because we wanted to do the opposite. Don't start with the opposite. The opposite is the negative. The opposite is our destructive side. You don't want to start with destruction. You want to start with construction. Because after you got into the scene, you were wonderful. Your whole life you've been waiting for her to come into this room. And you care, you care, you care, you care, you care, you care, you care. And otherwise, why would you shoot yourself at the end if you didn't care? It isn't futility over your writing. No. It's the loss of her, and therefore you will never write. Okay. Clear? Mm -hmm. it, yep. We start a scene going in to fight for what we need, not what we don't need, but what we need, what we want, what we can't live without. Then the opposite comes in when somebody hurts us and does not give us what they need, so then we hurt them back. Now it makes sense. Click. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, that's why I have to keep saying it in several ways, because a certain words will click with one person and not with another person. Mm. So I don't mind repeating. It just keeps going through my head sometimes that, um, and I'm not disputing what you said, I just want to let you know what I'm thinking, is that, you know, like sometimes we, we love somebody so much and all that can come out is just, just anger. And, That's true. And I just thought that, that with this, rather than make it like, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you, blah, 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 and then at the end kill myself, it's like throughout the whole thing, I won't let her come near me, I won't let her touch me because I know the second that she touches me, that's it for me. You know, that's it. Yeah, but that's what you want. I worked on a play called Jamaica, which starred Lena Horne and Ricardo Montalban. And I discovered that every Wednesday matinee and every Saturday matinee between performances, when everybody in the cast would go out to eat, Lena Horne stayed behind and worked with her trio on stage. 
singing stormy weather and all the songs she had sung all her life, perfecting them, still perfecting them. And I use this as an example to students that the way you achieve casualness on stage is through constant perfection of your technique so that it seems to come effortlessly. But it comes from hard, hard work and discipline. And she, there was never any greater example of that than this, watching Lena Horne do this. Watch the stars up in the sky While lying on a bed of clouds Floating ships go sailing by Not ever touching ground Jacket thoughts on windy nights They dashed upon a heap Mad had a said I could stay Key was mine to key Forgive me love, forgive this kiss Forgive the times we had to miss Didn't know your lovely lips Would turn out to be frozen ice cold whips Throw yourself into the deep Not knowing whether you can swim You'll soon learn quick enough Teacher says believe in eternal sin Crayon colored purple faces Flow down some corridor Let yourself drift to other places Don't look at what is yours Forgive me love, forgive this kiss Forgive the times we have a miss I didn't know your lovely lips Would turn out to be frozen ice cold whips Forget the birds, forget Forget the one you had to please Forget your baby Later on, when Stockard Channing got uh, the lead in her first film opposite Warren Beatty and Jack Nicholson in The Fortune, and there was a full page ad in the New York Times, I cut it out and I sent to Fosse. I said, Dear Fosse, Mike Nichols knows talent when he sees it, why don't you? <laughs> and he wrote back and he said, I never said she wasn't talented. It's just that I cannot work with girls with dirty fingernails. By the way, she auditioned 15 times for Pippin and didn't get it. Jill Clayburgh did. I have actors come and say, I auditioned for that show twice. What do you ask me in for again for? I said, it's a third chance for a job, you idiot. <laughs> come, maybe this time we want you. If they call you in 17 times, maybe, do you start thinking, maybe I'm just missing one little element or they wouldn't keep looking? Do you, do you start oh. looking around for that element or do you keep doing what you're doing? No, you keep doing what you're doing, but you always keep adding, adding new elements of your life to it, new discoveries to it, new opposites. You don't change it, you add to it. You don't throw away, you add to it. So it just gets better and better and better. Her 15th audition was uh, just brilliant. This is one of the reasons why I loved working with Bob Fosse more than anybody. The role was written of the leading player in Pippin for an 80-year-old white character man who was to be the head of a caravan of strolling players, like in Hamlet. And, and uh, we auditioned every 80-year-old man who could possibly make it to the theater. And I said, why don't we go another direction? He said, who do you have in mind? And I said, Ben Vereen. So I get Ben Vereen, I give him the script of Pippin. He works some of the songs from Pippin and some of the songs from his nightclub act and into the script gives a half-hour audition, which was simply sensational. And Fosse turns to the writers who are behind us and said, 
boys, back to your typewriter. The 80-year-old uh, leading player is now a black dancer. One of the reasons I think Jesus Christ Superstar was a teenage phenomenon was because it made Jesus and Judas and Mary and everybody else into a contemporary rock story that they could identify with and brought Jesus down to be one of them. Tom Hargan said, I don't want real actors, I want people. So anybody, any young person was allowed to come in to audition. So I get there for the first day and there are 12,000 people lined up around the block of the, for miles on end, all waiting to come in to audition for Jesus Christ Superstar. And I said to Tyler, I'm going to be an old man before we get through seeing all these people. We'll never get this thing finished. He said, oh, you'll be able to handle it. And walks away and leaves me with 12,000 people who can't sing. No, they just have to communicate strongly. Uh, because they, they were no higher in volume than some of the other people, but their desire to communicate was so strong. That is what causes us to hear. Their intimacy couldn't have been more intimate, and yet we heard every word, because they, their desire to communicate with one another was so strong. Philip? Well, they followed um, the really basic rules of improv. There wasn't any blocking that really happened in terms of, of any one of them denying information given to them. They accepted the information and, and included something else to take the scene even farther. It doesn't happen any other way. Mickey. That's the land, Mickey. <laughs> and jump! Oh, it doesn't work, Rudy. <laughs> It's got to be there. <laughs> I choreographed the fucking thing, I know it works. <laughs> the thing that you have to remember is that in relationships, what they did was Everything the other person did had a consequence in terms of the, of the partner. And we don't know what we're going to do until the person we're partnering with does something that we can react to. I'm sure there'll be a place for you somewhere. I can arrange something for you. Does the 1981 balletic blue medal mean anything to you at all? <laughs> Or the 1982, or the 1983, or 84, or 85. Rudy, those are my medals. This is my stage. It's my fucking dance. And I will do the jump like so! You're right, of course. So that this physicalizing is what is so necessary because it communicates so much more strongly than anything they said. Nothing they said was as strong as anything they did, was it? Dean? Um, when you're improving like that, the, uh, the importance of what you're doing, the important, importance of the communication is so there because you're depending on each other to survive. And, uh, and I think that's missing in the scenes or uh, not made as important, you know, the, the importance. And because if you don't, it falls flat. And I... But you see, everybody's improvs find these things out and then you don't carry them into the scene because you let the structure of the scene take over instead of the relationship take over. Very uh, interesting story about Come. Um, a girl came to work in Merrick's office as um, as a kind of general assistant, and she did work for me. And we got to be friends. Her name was Judith Rutherford. She is now Judith James and is co-producer with Richard Dreyfuss and Dreyfuss James Productions. So she's a Hollywood producer now. One day, a script on with no author arrived. And he said, so you want to produce? Produce. Gave me this play and I read it and 
I, it was, I was fascinated with its sexual politics, with its racial politics. She said, I want to produce, but I can't find the script. And I said, well, I read scripts for America all the time. I'll give you a couple that are interesting. So I gave her Call Me By My Rightful Name, changed the name of the author, and she came in uh, two days later and she said, I found the script I want to do. I want to meet the author. It was very funny in a 1940s, wonderful, charming Gene Arthur way, but it had this guts to it. So I said, OK, Michael, now who is it and everything? And so there was this difficult lunch. And so I said, well, sit down. She said, but well, when can I meet the author? I said, well, sit down. So she sat down. She said, when can I meet the author? I said, you're meeting him. I said, what do you mean? So said, I'm the author. You're the author. I still want to do the play. But you think about the early 60s, it was, it was before the civil rights marches and real consciousness, and it was shocking. We were talking about um, a white man and a black man, best friends, back for the, from the war, from Korean War, had both loved and slept with the same woman. And it was, like, powerful. Uh, I heard about this play, Call Me By My Rightful Name, and I went down and saw it down in Greenwich Village. And I was so taken with it, I went back the very next day and saw it again. I've never done that before. Uh, Robert Duvall played on both nights. Uh, Joan Hackett wasn't in it the first night. It was her understudy. The play was still so effective. It, it was one of the most thrilling theatrical experiences I've ever had. Uh, so subsequently, finally, uh, I optioned the the play, and we did make the movie back in 1972. I, I seem to remember it was the day before. It was even in previews. I don't remember it being before previews. They took a deep breath and asked me to, too. And with the opening date set and everything, and the cast scared enough, as not in this particular play, but any play, can I do it? Am I doing it right? Am I getting it? Don't bother me with any new lines. We're given a whole new third of the play. So there we were on putting the lights up and getting ready to do a tech, and Michael said that he had another opening, which was, like, unbelievable, that we would now have the 12th or 13th opening, and uh, it was just crazy, and I remember walking outside with him saying, you couldn't possibly have another, and what does this one do? And he gave me the pages, and they were better. So he sat down, and he read, and he said, oh, this is absolutely great. What a shame we can't put it in. And I said, why can't we put it in? He said, we open in three days. And I said, Milton, we're going to open in three days with the flop. If we change this, well, we have a chance. So we took a walk and we discussed this. I remember, I'll never forget this, walking through the deserted city at 6 o'clock in the morning. And it was, it was a wonderful walk. It's a walk that both of us remembered because it was very cooperative between a writer and a director. And we always had that kind of relationship, always helping him with the writing, him talking about the directing. It was a wonderful collaboration that always ended every evening with these thin Norwegian pancakes that he uh, made and that, that uh, uh, they're very special. The first one you throw away because it doesn't make it for whatever reason and then these pancakes. So the collaboration was always crowned with these wonderful thin Norwegian pancakes. The success of it, the reviews, the one of the reviews was Eureka, Mike Shirtliff has arrived. Um, there was a real feeling of, wow, look what we've done. Michael was working on, on shaping that thing we wanted to say and say to America, look at yourself, catch on to this, explore it, be open about what racism is in this country. And look at its personal basis, don't look at it as some philosophical thing. If evil exists, I think some philosophers said it's because good people allow it to. And I think that's part of the, the nature of this piece, which was, uh, in essence, really good people and seemingly unprejudiced person who was living with this black character. And, uh, and yet, somewhere underneath was lying this problem, because when he found out that the black character had, uh, had an affair with his girlfriend, now it was a 
totally different ball game, and he had to face something in himself. I, I think that's true in our lives, you know, that you you have something happening and you're not quite aware that you share that so-called evil with others that you've categorized as evil. On the opening night, I have to tell you one little story about opening night. I, I'm, I'm backstage and Shelley Winters comes through. Let me in, let me in. I want the author, I want the author, I want the author. Where the hell is the author? She comes up to me and she slaps me across the face like this. And I think, Jesus Christ, she must have hated this play. And she's, but she's crying. Tears are rolling down her face. And I said, why are you, why are you beating the shit out of me? And she said, because I wanted the happy ending, this beautiful play, and you didn't give me a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> In those days, Broadway was very active. Sometimes I cast 12 plays in one season. Now Broadway's lucky if it produces 12 plays in one season. And behind us are two of the most famous theaters empty. The Broadhurst Theater, the Schubert Theater, where our chorus line played for 15 years. And now they're nothing playing there. And this is unprecedented. The Broadway has gone steadily downhill in the last 10 or 12 years. Why do I love actors? Because of all the people in the world that I have met as a group of people, they are the most open, the most tolerant, the least bigoted, the most imaginative, the most willing to take risks, and the least conventional. What did I, what did I learn in the course as my, about myself? I learned I really need to go, to go to extremes, that I really need to let people see who I am and not be afraid to show that. And, it, and it's hard sometimes to really show yourself and show what you're really feeling and not be afraid that it'll be rejected. What do I think of him? Yeah. Talk the truth? <laughs> no, he's, um, it's very interesting to watch, but um, I think he's sort of condescending in his ways, but that's okay, I mean, he has a lot of, uh, his process, his ideas are very good, but I wouldn't take them literally, not for everything. Also, actors have a great struggle between, uh, this is insane what I'm doing and, and, and I should be sane. And I say to them, no, just give up all idea of sanity and accept that you're insane or you wouldn't be in this business, and then you'd be much happier. When I found out I was insane and totally accepted it, then I have no problem. But if you keep striving for sanity when you're not going to find any in this business, there isn't any, then you're just going to have make more problems for yourself. So accept that you are insane and go on and just become more insane. All the things that I was so afraid of are really not worth being afraid of. Um, even tonight, what Michael was saying about uh, why are you worried about that because I can't do anything about it, I can't change it. All I can do is what I can do. Um, I think that's really been important for me to learn because I've always uh, been very protective. So one strong thing that I've learned is that we are, we're going to be in all kinds of situations and we found ourselves in situations here that are embarrassing, stretching us to the limit and we're taking high risks and to do that you always have to uh, trust your own self and leave here no matter what anyone says you have to make your own mind up about your assessment of your work and um, because otherwise we'd go mad. To take risks, as many risks as you can in your acting. Uh, Michael said something early on in the course that uh, he said um, you've got to think of yourself as a troop of clowns and uh, go up there and make an ass of yourself and stop taking yourself so seriously basically. And, uh, that helped a lot. See, I think that people don't realize that the reason the real reasons why they do things are not reality, but fantasies. Fantasies of what they can become, of what their lives will be, of who they will love, of what kind of children they will have, of what kind of job they want. Everything is a fantasy that they want to make come true. So to me, fantasies are the greatest and most important part of human beings, not reality. Reality is what keeps pushing us down all the time, 
and fantasy is the only thing that makes us rise. I've just discovered today Ed, that I, I, I must be a fish because I breathe through my mouth. <laughs> you have to keep telling me to close my mouth. <laughs> what kind of people do you fall in love with, what sign? What kind or what sign? sign? Pisces and Cancer. Pisces and Cancer. <laughs> so you just have to get us all, don't you? <laughs> That's what Scorpios do. Yeah. Pick out cancers in order to torture them. <laughs> and cancers are highly torturable. Did you know that? No. Yes, yeah, very easy to torture cancer. Uh, Underneath this um, gruff exterior is a tender little heart waiting to be destroyed by, by a Scorpio. <laughs> <laughs> How about mortality? How do you feel about mortality, Michael? I think it's a bad thing. <laughs> it reminds me of uh, somebody asked Gandhi what he thought of Western civilization. Right. And he said, I think it would be a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> The stars up in the sky While lying on a bed of clouds Floating ships go sailing by Not ever touching ground Jacket thoughts on windy nights Lay dashed upon a heap Mad had a said I could stay Key was mine to keep Forgive me love Forgive this kiss Forgive the times we had to miss Didn't know your lovely lips Would turn out to be frozen ice cold lips Throw yourself into the deep Not knowing whether you can swim You'll soon learn quick enough Teacher says believe in eternal sin Crayon colored purple faces Go down some corridor Let yourself drift to other places Don't look at what is yours Forgive me love, forgive this kiss Forgive the times we had to miss I didn't know your lovely lips Would turn out to be frozen ice cold whips Forget the birds, forget the bees Forget the one you had to please Forget your baby 